Thanks, Alicia. Welcome to everyone today um, for the third in the series of um, the values messaging with Trudy Ryan. Um, the, today we're going to focus on language construction with Trudy. And so I'll just run through the same as what I've been doing, just in case anybody is um, new. We've all got different bandwidth, so can I ask you to mute your microphone during the presentation and turn off your video? Later in the webinar, when we start asking some questions, feel free to turn it back on so we can see who you are and put a face to your voice. Um, so most people will know how to use the bar at the bottom. Um, if you want to ask a question, feel free to just turn on your video or just push the hand and we'll certainly um, get to you. Otherwise, you can write a question in the sidebar. Um, so feel free to do that. And if all else fails, I have my emails open. So please feel free to email me. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land of which we are meeting in the Golden Broken, the people of the Yorta Yorta and the Tungarong Nation, as well as the Indigenous people of the lands you are joining in from. Um, we were just having a conversation with Trudy and Alicia before, and one of the things that I was particularly interested in is whether anybody has had the opportunity to use what Trudy's been saying um, or done something in the time that we've um, been meeting. So I, I'm just going to open it up. Um, you can write a message, you can talk to us, but just for five, you know, two to five minutes, I just thought it'd be really great to see if anybody had actually um, put into practice some of those things. It's always hard to sit and wait, and I'm not one of those people who do that well, so. <laughs> um, but if nobody else replies, I'm going to get Alicia back on because <laughs> I know she's got a story <laughs> and she's happy to provide her example. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, yeah, I was just telling Kirsty and Trudy before that um, as soon as I got off the the uh, messaging uh, session last week, I rang our comms team just to make sure the word hero was taken out of all our um, our, our media releases and social media around our recognition program, um, which we've released uh, for a couple of months, the opportunity for our land care groups to nominate um, individuals or groups to be recognised. Um, and the media release got taken up by about five local papers, which was great. And thankfully they didn't take up the word hero <laughs> from the from the media release we provided. So um, yeah, that was a, a reaction that, that I took straight away <laughs> on board <laughs> from last time. Thanks, Alicia. And that's interesting. And there's, you know, as I was saying last week, there's nothing terribly wrong with the word hero, but if we use it in all contexts, you know, we can't all be heroes. It sort of loses its meaning. Um, and it primes those those achievement values, those self-enhancement values. And really when we're looking for community connection, that sense of compassion, empathy, responsibility, stewardship, the intrinsic values are the safest ones to prime. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I did just forget to say that I am recording this again and my apologies for sending out um, a very shortened version of the webinar um, last week. If anybody went to view it, and I know some of you did, um, the, real, the real video is out now and I sent that link through l last night. So um, if anyone's missed anything, feel free to catch up. All right, over to you. Thanks, Trudy. Thanks, Kirsty. I'll just share my screen. Hi, right, so welcome back everybody um, for the third and third webinar in our four part series on base based messaging for change. Um, I'm Trudy Ryan from uh, Words for Change in North East Victoria and it's great to work with you all again today. So today we've, we've hopped up to week four. Um, in today's session, we're going to be looking at words, looking more closely at our language and our language choices and how the words we use can influence our message effectiveness. 
So this builds on our understanding from week one and two on facts and frames and values um, to, and really looks at how people reason and what this means for our messaging in land care, where we want to connect and engage people and prime those greater good those greater good values, the intrinsic values that we talked about last week around those segments, the benevolence, universalism, self-direction. So values like care, custodianship, stewardship, equality, social justice, wisdom, helpfulness, creativity, ingenuity, curiosity, those gain-based growth, anxiety-free, infinite values that activate those that research has shown activate those positive mindsets and activate positive change so um i've called this session more than words because words are really are more than words we know from week one and two that words evoke frames that activate values and those values based frames shape how or even if we respond to information so we'll spend the first part of today's session on metaphors so metaphors play an absolutely crucial role in reasoning. There's so much more to metaphors than you might recall from high school English. So we're not talking about Shakespeare or anything today, don't worry. Um, we're talking about how uh, understanding a metaphor can apply to mostly to natural resource management communication. So we'll go through some examples to build your understanding of metaphor and how it works in, in cognition and in knowledge transfer, and then consider how we might apply that to your Lancare messaging. Then in, in the second part of the session today, I'll go through some language-based strategies that will help you really strengthen your message, just some tips and techniques that you might be able to put into practice straight away to make your messages more persuasive. All right, so in, I'll just run you through an example so that we can, we can start building our understanding of how metaphor works in your brains to help you understand your concepts. So in week one, we talked about frames as being the cognitive shortcuts through which we filter and perceive information. We talked about neural circuits in the brain, about neurons firing and wiring together and becoming stronger and more entrenched when they're activated and, and repeated. So encouraged by this image that I showed that went with the descriptions, we could imagine that circuitry in our head firing and wiring and it's based pretty much probably we we're drawing an on an understanding of how electrical circuitry works to, to create circuits and currents. So we could understand the, equally, we could understand the idea of mutual inhibition, that concepts that says that we can understand multiple viewpoints, but not at the same time. So we could understand this. And again, it was aided by the, the visual of this man. You can see his front profile, you can see his side profile, but you can't see them at the same time. And we could sort of get the gist of this. We could understand this perhaps by our understanding of something like house wiring and house circuitry. So even if we have a really basic understanding of how electrical wiring works, and mine is extremely basic, we can still use what we know from our lived experience of flicking on and off thousands and thousands of light switch and electrical switches over the course of our life. We could kind of use that to get the gist of the concept you got what I meant, you saw what I mean, you know. Um, so different frames and different values activate different switches in your head um, and you can turn off uh, off and on different reasoning pathways. Obviously, it's much more complicated than that, um, but this is the idea of metaphor. We use our understanding of one thing in order to describe or understand another. So we're using our lived experience. We're, we're, transferring our understanding of something that we know, something concrete that we, we know, and we're applying that to learn something new or describe something abstract or intangible like, like values. We need metaphor to, to help us describe these concepts. Um, so here's another example from our learning. Last week we talked about values as providing a signpost. Um, that would guide your audience towards a particular values orientation. And you could get it, you could get the gist of what I meant about this values orientation and a signpost metaphor because of your lived sort of perceptual understanding of direction. You know, we're using direction every day. So you got it because we're so accustomed to building our understanding of the world through metaphor. And this is a really important concept to get our head around in messaging. 
So metaphors are more than a matter of words, they're a matter of thought. They shape our thinking, mostly again beneath the conscious, the level of our conscious awareness. Um, metaphor comes from the Greek metaphora, which means to carry across, to transfer. And apparently this is what you see on, written on the sides of buses and transit vehicles in Greece, as they carry people and other things from one place to another. It's like a metaphor in itself. So this is what happens in metaphor. We carry over our knowledge of something known, something concrete, something tangible, something experienced, and we call that a source domain, and we, we carry that over and all the associations that we have around that when we're attempting to understand something new, abstract or intangible. So, and we call the knowledge that we have, we call that a source domain. What, what are we calling on? What, what have we got in our heads and our bodies that we can draw on? So it's often related to things like what we've experienced through sight, sound, taste, touch, um, up, down, you know, movement, that perceptual motor sort of experience as well. And we apply this knowledge when we're trying to understand something new. So we transfer those associations to something called the target, what we call the target domain. And um, we use those associations to try and understand stuff. So, and it's usually less tangible things that are really hard to put into words, like uh, about new concepts, life, love, death, emotions, feelings. We have to describe it using th something else. So in a nutshell, we learn about something new by comparing it to something that we know. And then we're, we're building new neural, neural connections around that understanding. So I'll just go through an example that we'd be all familiar with to show how these metaphors creep into our language without us even being aware of it. So in this case, I'm going to use your known, tangible, lived, concrete knowledge of direction. That's your source domain that you're calling on to describe something to you that might otherwise be really abstract and intangible, like some where someone's at in their life. So listen in, listen in for the metaphors. You can stay on the straight and narrow. You can get on track, take the load less travelled. You can lose direction, take a wrong turn. You can feel lost. You can be told to get lost. You can take the high road, the low road. You can feel directionless go round and round in circles, come to a fork in the road. You can march ahead and so it goes on and on. And you only know what I mean there because you're referencing or drawing on your lived experience of direction, your source domain. So we're speaking and understanding about life and where someone is at their life. That's a very abstract concept in terms of direction, which is something that we can concrete, we have concrete tangible understanding of. So there's books and papers galore written on this idea of conceptual metaphor um, and it forms this really foundational aspect of human communication and cognition and yet it's it's only emerged as a field in the last few decades um, pioneered by Professor George Lakoff who was also the framing bureau that I mentioned in session one. So I can um, send some links out so you can learn more about this because it's you know it's so fundamental to communication. So just to demonstrate the prevalence of metaphor in language, can you believe that we, we use about six metaphors a minute? It's very surprising. It's wow, really? Because we think that we're talking so literally all the time, but we're not, we're really talking in pictures so often. So that's about one metaphor every 10 or 25 words or so, or sometimes more. And we barely notice it because we're so used to encountering metaphor in our everyday speech. It just slips beneath the level of our conscious awareness. We don't even notice it. So I've just got a few different examples from um, current and recent events just to show you the prevalence of metaphor in our language. Um, I've shown the metaphors in red. So as I read them out, think about the frames the metaphor evokes the set of associations and understandings of what you know built on your lived concrete experience and how you map that understanding. You transfer that understanding to understand the new thing. So this one, life during lockdown, um, explaining about what it's like to be in COVID, using a metaphor of being in a leaky raft boat. Life during lockdown is starting to seem like a le leaky inflatable raft submerged under the water. Perhaps the tiny punctures were always there, 
but it's only now in the crisis that we see the streams of bubbles and realise where we were losing air. It's very rich in metaphor. The author is trying to describe something that was pretty new that we're all getting a little bit used to now. Um, life under lockdown in terms of that leaky inflatable raft. So even if you haven't actually sat in a leaky inflatable raft, you've got enough life experience to know. It's about uncertainty, a bit of a sinking feeling. You're not sure what's coming next. Um, vulnerabilities might be coming a little bit more apparent. So we, we get the gist. Here's another one. This one's, I've gone for a politics one because they're always quite rich in metaphor. This was from um, the when Malcolm Turnbull was ousted by his party. The eruption of the Liberal Party's civil war has crept up for weeks, but by Wednesday the Dutton camp knew it was game on. Malcolm Turnbull, besieged by his own party colleagues, strapped explosive devices to himself and dared them to come and get him. Ah, oh, you know, you read this and you're just in that war zone. You can feel the battleground that it, you know, you can, the tension that must be in that Liberal Party room. So when we're using a war metaphor to describe politics, the associations we're bringing about war is that it's horrible. There's tension, there's winners, there's losers, there's opponents, there's a battle. And the, the author has really clearly got, captured the moment there for us. Um, pop culture as well is, is rich in metaphor. Pop songs, if you listen to the radio, sorry, you'll be singing this all day, I know. Nothing I can say, a total eclipse of the heart. Classic pop song, use of metaphor. You've got to try and get across a story in three minutes. So next time you're driving around, have a listen. Listen in on the golden oldies or whatever you listen to, um, where you might hear a total eclipse of the heart. And um, listen for those metaphors. What does a total eclipse of the heart, what, how does that reference heartache, you know, it's blackness, it's loss. Um, maybe there's a light at the, end the, at the end of the tunnel too, so it's not all negative. So metaphors are everywhere in the arts, economics, politics, um, sports reporting is full of them, advertising, psychology, natural resource management, land care, they're everywhere. Um, Metaphor has a really powerful effect on reasoning. Think back to our picture of the child shining a light in the pond from week one. And in the survey in week one, someone actually came up with this metaphor. So thank you for that. They said we need to shine a light on the pond to understand these framing effects. So thanks, whoever that was. So our focus is drawn to where the light is shining. Other elements are there and they could be highlighted if the light was shone elsewhere, but it's not. It's on the fish. It's the same with metaphors. They can foreground one type of thinking or interpretation over another as we bring our concrete knowledge and understanding of something and we try to apply it to understand something new. So metaphors slip under our radar. There's another metaphor in itself. Um, and shape our reasoning mostly beneath the level of our conscious awareness. And the poet Shelley in 1821 said that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And this is just a reflection of this ability of words to just get in there and shape and shift our reason, mostly undetected. So does it matter? Is it just a matter of, of poetic language or is it more than that? And it turns out there's some great research studies now to show that it matters so much, the words that we choose. So metaphors work to shape our thought. Think about where the light shining on the pond. There's a metaphor there. <laughs> um, and they can work to shape our opinion and even policy recommendations. So I want to run you through a, a really fantastic case study to illustrate this point. So in this study, there was two groups of people. One were told, they were told exactly the same crime statistics for their town, the city of Addison. The only difference in the description was, is that one group were exposed to the term wild beast to describe crime. And the second group, crime in their city with the exact same statistics, crime was des described as a virus infecting their city. So remember with the metaphors, we transfer what we know about the source domain to understand the target domain. So if we're talking about wild beasts, what do we think about when we think of the term wild beast? So just have a moment to think about that. 
you might just, you know, it's something you want to get rid of or get away from. And you want someone to take down the wild beast. It's a completely different line of reasoning. What do we know about viruses? Gosh, we know more about viruses now than we did a few months ago. We, we know all sorts of things about viruses. And so people have got these, these interpretations, these associations, these understandings from their source domain, their lived experience. And when crime is described using these metaphors, it activates all those neural circuits. It brings to life all those associations. And we use that then to understand the target domain, to understand, in this case, crime. So the people in this study were then asked to say, well, what should we do about crime in our city? The people that were exposed to the beast, crime is a beast metaphor, you won't be surprised to hear that their solutions were things like more police, lock them up, get them off the streets, harsher laws, longer sentences. The people who were exposed to the metaphor crime is a virus affecting our city went for completely different recommendations. Focus on prevention, investigate the cause, treat the problems, they were even suggesting things like mandatory preschool, after school care. So very much went on the prevention, looking at the whole cause rather than just trying to uh, suppress the beast. So the absolutely interesting thing about this study was at the end of it, people were asked the question, on what did you base your recommendations for crime in this city? 97% of people said it was the statistics. Incre like incredible number. Only 3% of people said, oh, I was kind of the metaphor, but they were probably linguists. So, but 97% of people, almost everybody, just said, oh, the statistics, because we think we're making these rational decisions based on facts and data alone. But in this case, the, the differences were so profound in what the two groups actually came up with. So metaphors are more than just a matter of words. They're a matter of thought and they can shape our reasoning. Here's another example. This is a report I saw this week. Um, it's more subtle. This is a more subtle example, but it's stuff we have to watch out for. Um, so here's a, a report called Getting Off Coal and it was just released and it's about phasing out um, coal in Australia. So what's the source domain of getting off coal? If you really think about what's that evoking, it's about addiction. And what do we know about addiction? We know it's hard, it's difficult to break, it's costly, it's painful, it involves sacrifice, prone to relapse, that kind of thing. And is that the understanding and associations we want to transfer and map onto renewable energy? Does it help the case? Does it make it sound possible, doable? You know, we get so few opportunities to connect and activate the values. We need to make the most of it. So we've, we've talked a lot about saying what you're for, not what you're against. You know, clean, locally made energy, free energy from the wind and sun, that kind of thing, more empowering and taking shifting people's orientation into what you want them to think. So remember that metaphors, they're, they're like thinking devices. And if you change the metaphors, you can change the parameters of thought. You're going to shine the light on a different part of the pond. So climate change language is full of metaphors. We use all metaphors all the time to describe climate change. So we, you know, we, there's a war on climate change. There's a race against climate change. Climate change is a ticking time bomb. Greta Thunberg famously said, our house is on fire. Using two metaphors, earth is our home, very powerful, you know, very sort of visceral, gets to you. Um, and extreme temperatures is fire. So of course, literal fire, bushfire, as well as a metaphorical sort of sense of fire and heating up, burning up. And there's a, there's a good deal of study and opinions starting to come out now testing these different metaphors and what this does for public opinion and persuasion. Um, and different metaphors are appropriate in context, depending on the point you want to make. 
But one really um, interesting thing that's been pointed out by a UK social scientist, um, George Marshall, who some of you might know of his book. It's called Don't Even Think About It, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Ignore Climate Change, which is just a fantastic read, and I'll send a link out to that. He makes the point that some of these, these metaphors, they don't transfer very well. So what we know about the source domains of war, race, time bombs, they're all things that come to an end. They actually, you know, wars end, races end, time bombs go off, have an end point. Whereas climate change, it doesn't come to an end, you know, and it's there's not going to be an end point. And that what really we need to be telling people and getting across is that, you know, climate change is about, it's about adapting and preparing for a different future. So climate change is so overwhelming and so unprecedented that we actually don't have anything tucked away in our source domains to truly convey the complexity and the vastness of it. So it's a, it's a difficult one. There's a lot of message testing going on around this. So how can we actually really communicate this most effectively? House on fire is better, but it doesn't help people understand the system effects of a disrupted climate. So, you know, that, that might manifest some in some places and at some times as, you know, record snow dumps and cold, intense rainfall and cold snaps. And I'm sure you've all heard people saying on a cold day, oh, what about all that global warming? You know, people, a lot of people lack a systems understanding and can't link the two. And rem remember, if you, if you don't believe it, you won't see it. Facts bounce off frames. Um, a group called the Frameworks Institute in the US has done a lot of message testing on climate metaphors, and they offer a couple of metaphors that work quite well to build our systems understanding that really show how things are interconnected and interact in complex ways. So one they say works really well is a heat trapping blanket. That's something we've all experienced, that, that feeling of being overheated by a heat trapping blanket. If you've ever left, left your electric blanket on overnight, you know what that's all about. Um, so when we burn fossil fuels like coal and gas, we pump more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This builds up, you know, creates a blanket effect, trapping heat around the world. You can imagine it because you're building your, you're taking your experience, your lived experience, and you can map that to understand this new concept. Another one that they say works well is using the metaphor of the ocean as the climate's heart, which builds also builds these systems understanding. So it's important that we try and get people thinking about this system's complexity and how things are interrelated. So this metaphor uses the source domain of our heart, which we know has a, a big role to play in keeping our body systems going, and we map that understanding onto the target domain of climate systems. So just as a heart circulates blood and regulates the body's temperature, the ocean regulates the world's climate system by controlling the circulation of heat and moisture. So it's really getting into that lived experience of us as a functioning human body and applying that knowledge to understand something new and very complex. Um, last week we had a, a discussion at the end about dung beetles. Um, it might have been after we finished recording, I'm not sure. Um, and about what values could you prime to promote a field day on dung beetles? So I just had a little think about that. Um, who wouldn't want to come to a field day on dung beetles? They're awesome. So through metaphors, what source domains are you activating in people? What knowledge will they bring from their lived experience to try and understand what you mean? So things like dung beetles doing a good turn on your farm, dung beetles worth their weight in gold, Dung beetles, without them, we'd be in the uh, dung. Uh, dung beetles, let's dig in, that idea of curiosity. Dung beetles, the hardest workers on your farm. So depending on what kind of description you're going, you're drawing on different source domains and understanding, and you're describing different roles and relationships of dung beetles. Are they workers? Are they your friends? Are they an, like an economic asset? Are they a partner? So, you know, depending on what values you wanted to prime and what context you're in, you can think about what sort of descriptions, what source domains are you drawing on? Um, and think about you know, how can I activate greater good thinking? How can I get people to go sort of, you know, beyond, beyond perhaps, say, the economic benefits 
and look at you know the broader environment, socio-environmental benefits. So equally, things like paddock trees could be stepping stones for birds, you know, to go beyond just provision of shade. Dead standing trees can be like high rise accommodation for wildlife. That sort of thing that draws on our lived experience as humans so that we can sort of understand and conceptualise in a broader sense. So just to get you thinking a little bit about more about that, just for a moment, you can just choose one of those images there and think about how you might use metaphor to describe your role in land care. So if you want to just take a moment, um, you probably had something pop into your mind straight away because that's how we understand reason about things. But if you want to have a crack at describing your role at, in land care using one of these metaphors, and if you'd be willing to just pop that in the, the chat box, um, and you get bonus points if you can link your metaphor to a values activation. So there's an achievement prime for you straight away. <laughs> so it's a good thing to do to just come up with your metaphor, do a values check in. Is that what you wanted to say? Is that the values that you wanted to activate? So I'll just give you a few minutes. We've already got some. So we've got <laughs> some. Um, we've got the glue that sticks our community together. Yeah. Learning our craft, bridge builder. Yeah, great, great. Anyone with the web? Thinking you are the Victorian Land Care Network. Could you? Navigating the web. Thanks, Alicia. I would have th thought something along the lines of we are the, we are the spiders creating the web of um, activation, active movement or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yep. What about the, the river flowing through the landscape? You could on a curvy path, yeah, yeah. And getting the web. Um, you could be like, you know, the information that flows across the landscape. And you can extend these metaphors as well. So, you know, the glue, you could, you could be, you know, school glue, you're just learning, you know, craft glue. You know, we already talked about learning our craft. There's one from Alicia. You could be super glue that's, that brings everyone together. So you can just sort of start thinking in, in these terms of what source domains am I drawing on and people's understanding in trying to describe something like your job you know people say what do you do try and build uh, a metaphor into that description next time you do it you probably already do it already all right um if there's no more examples we'll, we'll move on and I just have one um oh, yeah. sorry from oh no that's okay <laughs> She just wasn't allowed in the chat. So um, sorry, Wendy, about that. No worries. Just keep typing on the email and I'll see it. Like the river, we are the lifeblood of our community. The lifeblood, that, that's beautiful. And it's very evocative and you get it. We can draw on that from our lived experience. So thank you for those. But yeah, just, just have a bit of a think about it. Okay, so for the next part of the session, just going to run through some tips and techniques for strengthening your, your messages. So, you know, think about how do you get your message across the road amongst all that traffic? There's a metaphor. Or if you like a different metaphor, here's some tools, a communication toolbox, tools to tinker with your message, give your message a tune up. So, you know, once you start getting into this metaphor spotting, it's endless, it's everywhere. So just think of these as some ideas, um, that you can include. You don't have to include them in every message, but they do help to build a compelling message. Next week, we'll go into message construction in more detail as we sort of bring our knowledge of values, frames, metaphors, imagery, um, all together. All right, so I'm going to start with this one. Um, trim the hedge. What do I mean by this? These are hedge words. We aspire to restore landscapes, we aim to, we hope to, we work to. These hedge words are the little qualifiers, the little cautious maybes that we add into otherwise firmer statements. 
Um, it's very common in scientific writing, and which may be appropriate if you're trying to demonstrate uncertainty in a scientific sense, but it creeps into our advocacy writings, it creeps into company vision statements and goal statements, and it creeps into our general communication and, and education engagement communications as well. And we all do it, and it's partly because we're polite um, and we don't want to seem bossy, but when we insert these qualifiers, we risk not looking sure about our message, not looking confident about what we're saying. So it really dilutes the strength and the power of your message. So the good thing is that hedging is actually really easy to fix. All you have to do is delete them. We restore landscapes is more fulfilling, inspiring, empowering than just as aspiring to. We restore landscapes. You can feel the actual body language changes when you say that. It gives you it sort of puffs you up. So have a look at your messages. Find these little words. Work out where you can trim the hedge. Because it's something you can almost do instantly from your writing. Speaking from another inevitability is another way that we can really improve our message messages and make them stronger and more compelling. So think and really focus on the feeling, how you feel reading the difference between these two statements. If we protect native, if we protect red, remnant vegetation on our farms, when we protect remnant vegetation on our farms. So only one word of difference there, but the when gives us a sense of purpose, conviction, presence. It feels more empowering, it's going to happen, and we can start moving through to the benefits. But with if, we're still on the starting blocks, there's another metaphor there. It's about if we do it. We, you know, we're a long way off getting to the benefit stage. If adds distance, uncertainty, in a sense of implausibility. So we want to reduce those messages, those, that distance in our messages. So if uh, we should, or we might, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of thing, they're extensions of that trimming the hedge com concept because they're about confidence and confidence can build trust. So we want our messages to build momentum. We want them to convey plausibility. It's not, you know, sometimes our, it's not that people don't agree with our messages, but sometimes we, in beneath the level of that conscious awareness, we make them seem implausible by putting these little hedge terms and using if instead of when. So, you know, we can just look for ways that we can strengthen our languages by just changing subtle emphasis on these little words. You know, it's not if, it's when. The other thing we can really do is um, build our understanding of concepts through explanation. So this is, um, we'll, this is a really important concept to get across because I think in persuasion it's important, but also we should always really respect our audience's potential and ability to learn. You know, you hear the phrase, oh, it's, it's really condescending. People say, we need to dumb that down a bit. We need to take a, techni a technical report and dumb it down. We don't need to dumb things down. We need to respect people's ability to learn and understand that. What we need to do is explain things better, I think. So one way that we can do that is to build really simple but effective causal change. So just sort of keep that visual metaphor there of, of the chain, because we want to talk people through cause, effect and solutions. So when you do this, when you're explaining to people how one thing leads to another and then what we can do about it, it gives people a really satisfying message. And we're actually closing off a logic loop as well. You know, you're saying A plus B equals C. If we this causes this, if we do this about it, you know, this will be the effect. I'll run through an example so you can see what I mean. But it reduces misunderstanding. If you leave things open, people might come to a completely different conclusion than you intended. So think of the idea of closing off the logic loop in your chain. Here's an example. I'll just extend that metaphor before. And this comes from um, the Frameworks Institute in the US. And they have a great little booklet on the power of explanation that I'll send through to you today that runs through the logic of, of this. 
So when we burn fossil fuels like coal and gas, we pump more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This builds up and creates a blanket effect trapping heat around the world. So that, that's the cause. If nothing is done to halt this process, the planet we leave our children will be hotter with more violent weather, fewer species and more disrupted systems. So they're explaining the effects. And then from there, you can move into the solutions. We need to transition to clean energy and off you go. But you're building up that idea of an explanatory chain in people's head. This leads to this, leads to this. It's a very satisfying message because it sort of answers the why. Um, another thing, it's always hard to find the right images to go with this story. I'm, I'm sure you've all had this, the desperate, you've written the piece, now the desperate search for the picture. You can't find it. It's very difficult. Don't be tempted to use any old picture to fill the gap. So one third of our brain is dedicated to visual processing. It's really important that the images we use tell the same story that as we've written. Um, go back to our helpful frames from week one. Remember, we're wanting to inspire hope over fear, reduce psych psychological distance more to here now together, as opposed to there, them and there in the future. And connect and cross scales to really bridge what we're doing to something broader and other domains as well. So keep those in mind. Always keep the values that we want to prime in mind as well in your photos. And just check in, is this photo representing these values in frames that are going to help my message to sing and really resonate. A more, some more specific advice is really real people in place. Um, your land carers, they know their landscape, they know that vegetation in the background is not from their landscape. It's more authentic, more meaningful. If, you, if you're really referencing real people, recognisable that people can see themselves in. Tell news stories as well, as well as sort of um, the typical photos that we use, go for some news stories, mix it up a little bit. Um, you know, we've got a lot of news stories to tell now. How are you connecting farmers with farmers online? You know, it's a whole new world. Curiosity is also a great angle to take and people love these little close up photos. It's a really good one to keep in your head. You see them in newspapers all the time. Just sort of keep your eye out for, for these photos. They're very powerful. Um, and use images that tell our stories at different scales. And this is a, this idea of connecting and crossing scales. So we can show tree planting on site as we usually do, but you know, get a drone up and take an aerial shot of the landscape that you're restoring. And then, you know, in your stories, talk about another land care group somewhere else doing the same thing. And that builds that sense of collective action, adding up to real change across the landscape. Um, the other thing to keep in your mind too is just this idea of talking in pictures. So people are visual, they're very visual. Um, use terms that evoke images that people can connect to or feel part of. So the term environment, we all use it and I use it all the time. Um, but if you can, try and bring a bit more life into it. So, you know, you sort of suddenly go from two dimensional to three dimensional. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the creeks, the rivers, the wild places, you know, people and place, our living world. It's just got more meaning. There's more emotion in that. Same with species like uh, terms like species and biodiversity. Use the talking pictures, use the language so that people can see what you're talking about. We're talking about life, we're talking about plants, wildlife, trees, shrubs, grasses, herbs, um, different animals, invertebrates. So a really handy tip after you've written something, say to go in the Landcare magazine or out in a newsletter, <laughs> look at what you've, you've written and just try in the margin, just see if you can draw it. That's just a really interesting exercise to go through. And if you can't sort of draw what you've written, you, you're not really talking in pictures. People might not see what you mean. So it's just a little check in. The other thing that's a handy one to keep in mind as well is this people do things rule. So science language is often written in a very passive form format. It's that cautious language again that that tends to creep over from science into efficacy and engagement comms. So obviously I don't mean literally for this image to, you know, I don't want anyone to be taken <laughs> to court or anything. It's just a good image to actually demonstrate. We use all this passive language. We say things like the, the habitat was destroyed. 
the creek was polluted, the population crashed. And what this does is conceal responsibility and it hides an origin story and it stops us thinking about, well, hang on, well, how did this happen and what were the motivations behind that? Um, so it, it, it broadens our view. If we can bring in actors and agents, why did people do this? So, for example, um, Habitat was destroyed. Instead of saying that, telling a more clearer story, people collected firewood illegally from the National Park, destroying habitat for ground dwelling wildlife. A fuller, more active sentence with agents and actors gives you a better understanding of an issue. And the other really interesting cognitive thing is, is if we take people out of a sentence, if we say habitat was destroyed, for example, it's sort of cognitively, cognitively very difficult for us to understand that people can fix the problem. So if there's no agent there, the sort of the message is that there's nothing or no one that can take responsibility for doing something. So just prompt yourself with this idea of people do things. Are you closing logic loops? Are you including an origin story? How did this happen? Are you telling the full tale? Does your sentence have actors and agents? Quickly too, I just wanted to a um, little shout out to not myth bust. But in week one, we talked about negation. I uh, remember I said, don't think of an elephant, don't think of an elephant. What do you think of? You think of an elephant because you have to think about something in order not to think about it. Myth busting is a form of this negation and you, we need to avoid it. And we do it all the time in environmental and ag communication and it's ex extremely prevalent in climate change communication as well. Um, I'll grab an example from somewhere else. This is a, from Rotary. And as with all myth busters, you can see in this one, the myths, the incorrect information that they want to negate or refute is set in the catchy headlines. Men only, got to be old. That's why your eyes are drawn. Um, they're often supported by really eye-catching graphics. And this is the case with myth busters everywhere. So the negation is wordy. Um, the, the little, it's not like that at all. There are women at Rotary, but you can't, you can barely read it. The dense sentences, people don't read um, much anymore. They tend to skim the headlines. So myth busters are quite dangerous because you're actually getting people to read incorrect information. And it just sort of lends credence to the idea of, you know, un ideas that you don't want to debate. So I want to show you this was a positive frame approach from Rotary. And just you can feel the difference in this. We are Rotarians, so there's no hedging comments in this. It's just we are. We build communities, we cure disease, we build minds. You know, you just read that and you think, I want to join Rotary. You know, you read the myth buster and it's like you come away with a whole lot of misconceptions. So drop myth busting out of your, um, your comms toolkit. So remember, tell people what you want them to think or do, not what you don't want them to think or do. A very important difference. Sell the outcomes and not the process. Sell the, sell the cake and not the recipe. So as advocates and educators, we often get caught on the detail and we start writing and, and we, we write in our communications about the 10 point policy plan and the three year funding cycle and all that stuff. Um, and people generally, a lot of audiences don't need to hear that. They just want to know how their life will be better. So think sell the cake and not the recipe. You know, if we write things, you know, <clears throat> like we talk about sustainable diversion limits or something else, that's sort of about the process. That's about the recipe. People want to hear the outcome, you know, leave enough water for wildlife and farmers and towns downstream. So people want to hear about the cake. Yeah, um, of course, some audiences need to have their idea, their eye on the detail, but not all, all audiences. Most people just want to hear about the cake. Um, as we're getting towards the end of our session today, try taking a really solutions oriented focus in your messaging. Focus more on the benefits of action over the risks of, of non-action, which is what we tend to focus on in environmental communications. Um, you know, we're always trying to get people's attention. Um, and we know from what we've talked about that that shock, horror and fear-based messaging tends to actually turn people away. 
if we take a solutions focus, you know, and incorporate some of the messaging aspects we've talked about today, it builds momentum and it builds social norms around care and responsibility and action for the greater good. So, you know, there's no doubt this has been a tough year and it continues to be tough, but we've also learned a lot about kindness and community and connection and compassion and also that the structures and systems and governance and things like that can change. You know, they're not set in stone is another metaphor. So we need to keep in activating the intrinsic values in our messages, you know, set our messages in these shared values and inspire op optimism through solutions, not just focus on problems. So of course we have to be very real about the challenges we face, but we have to offer some hope. You know, we have to have something to work towards and not just against. So keep focusing on, on that solutions orientation. Last for today, we finish on repetition. Um, there's an old marketing standard that says people need to see or hear your message seven times before they'll remember it. I'm not sure how true that is or not, but it's, it's something to really keep in mind. So repetition we know reinforces values priming and strengthens those frames. So you say it, say it and say it again. And over time we know that this framing becomes normal, becomes our idea of social, of common sense you know, build social norms, it demonstrates social proof. So say it in words and pictures, say it in values and frames. Uh, and in the spirit of repetition, I'll finish on something I've said a few times already, is that intrinsic values are your friends, keep that in mind. Um, we need to activate those intrinsic values based frames for reasoning and signpost people towards the greater good values in our messaging. So thanks today, and we've, we've got some time for questions as well. So thanks for your attention. Sorry, Trudy, thanks for that. That was fantastic. Um, I have a email. Um, <laughs> I have an email from Rob from Northern Yarra Lancare. And it says, so funny, I have a member who's keen to write an article for the local paper. Her draft breaks all the rules. Oh. I don't want to put her off, but <laughs> suggestions. <laughs> um, and before we go on to that, um, I, I actually was thinking, um, going, how do we get better? How do we improve our messaging and our... And I, I wonder whether it's a bit of, bit of a, a, a mentoring group or a group for afterwards. So I was just going to say to everyone, if you are interested about improving your messaging, is it worth us um, developing a sort of a communities of practice, I suppose, around this, that we can support each other and, and help each other out occasionally? So just keep that in the back of your minds, but yeah. we'll go back to this question. I have a member who's keen to write an article for the local paper. Her draft breaks all the rules. I don't want to put her off, but uh, suggestions. Uh, yeah, well, any uh, you know, members, you, you don't want to quash anybody's enthusiasm or commitment, of course. So uh, gently, gently, I'd say, um, and just very, you know, tactfully point out, you know, we could actually, that's that might be making people think about you know, this, we could flip it around and make them feel about this. And doesn't that make you feel better? You know, I find in workshops and, um, you know, webinars these days, you can draw attention, people's attention to how something actually makes them feel physically. And you can actually feel sometimes in messaging a physical and a physiological response. You know, when you're up in that those intrinsic values and you're talking about gain and growth, you can actually feel yourself grow with possibility and if you're talking down in that sort of fear resource limitation area that you know protection against threat you can feel yourself actually get smaller so you know even in your body language as you're talking to this person the language that you use just pointing to the more positive way talking about shared values saying what we're for not what we're against it feels better so if you can sort of provide that, gently provide that alternative way to look at stuff, 
people do get a bit of a light bulb going, oh, yeah, that feels better because it actually it, it does feel better. It's quite embodied and, and visceral. So good luck with that, Rob. <laughs> Rob, I hope that was um, worthwhile. Any other questions? We've got a we've got a fair few people who are saying yes, a community practice or something would be good. So I'll follow that up, Trudy. Yeah, for sure. And it's great to just share those examples. You know, the the one about getting off coal. You know, I saw that this week in my email. I thought, oh, you know, it, they're just they're subtle little things. But as I you know, I keep harping on about, we get so few opportunities to really get our message across. We have to make sure it counts as best as we can. Yep, there's lots, lots um, coming in. Um. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's just around that communities of practice and stuff. Um. Sure. Kirsty, yeah. I, I like what Karen O'Keefe has said in the chat box about She's been a land care facilitator for 15 years and I still don't know how to explain what we do simply. <laughs> I, I like that. And metaphors needed. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Sure, and, and it is, it's a complex role. And But you are, the, those images that I put up, they were, they were to really prompt you to think about in terms of that that network role that you you play the glue, you know, the information flowing through the landscape, look the conduit that you are, the connector. So even just thinking about in those terms, you know, I'll, you know, I'll try thinking in completely different terms. Think about the stuff that's on your desk, a stapler. Can you describe what you do with that? You know, a, a feather that you're floating around in the landscape from place to place. So just start just trying to train your mind to talk in pictures. Mm. Yeah, and just have a little think about it um, and do some metaphor spotting. You know, I said before about the, um, you know, put the radio on, you know, as you're driving about. Not that we're driving about much these days, but, um, you know, you can, you can pick it up in the news reports, the sports reports, the weather, you know, it's raining cats and dogs, all that kind of thing. And just try and sort of do some metaphor spotting and just realise Gosh, it's just so prevalent in our language and just beneath that level of our conscious awareness. But the metaphors are shining lights on different parts of the pond. There's a metaphor to explain metaphor. Um, and, you know, it's really important that we sort of just review our, our written and um, verbal communication in land care. Are the metaphors we're using, are they activating the mindsets and the associations and the values that we intended them to do? Mm. Most by instinct, you'll do it right by instinct, but just think if there's an opportunity to strengthen it, you know, really sort of investigate what that opportunity is. Um, if anybody else has something, please feel free, but I'm actually um, at the moment embedding myself in reporting and so much of that is just facts and figures and you touched on that a little bit today, but um, getting our story across needs more than facts and figures. Um, and so that that's a really interesting challenge going forward to really sell what we do in yeah. our reporting. Mm. Well, and, and reporting as well. Um, you know, I read a thing not so long ago about, you know, 80% of people are just reading headlines these days. Um, not necessarily in reporting, but in newsletter communications and things like that. So really trying even to sort of talk in pictures in your head in your headlines and your subheadings and so making sure that there's you know you've got like a story cohere coherence um, in your headlines so people are getting the gist they're able to bring you know their understandings of what they know and map that onto what you're telling them which is something new but even in reporting we, we use those hedging terms all the time so to make your reporting stronger just you know cross out those aim to hope to working towards you know, and say with greater strength what it is that you're doing to really get mm. the, your conviction mm. as well in your purpose. Yeah, so, good one. I've got a question here from Aisha. What about infographics? Are they useful? Yeah, I, I think infographics are really important, Aisha, and particularly as people do get, you know, have, have less time or they're, they're more distracted or, or whatever it is that we're not reading. 
So infographics can be a really great communication tool because they do they do sort of act with metaphor. You know, we are taking our understanding of something we know in order to understand something new. So icons can be extremely important communication tools. So yeah, metaphors can be really visual as well as you know the written word or the spoken word. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I keep forgetting to turn that mute on um, or off. Any other questions? I've got to thank you. Um, I think what we'll do now is we'll stop recording. Sure. And if people want to stay for another five minutes, then um, feel free to stay on board. Otherwise, thank you so much again for joining us and um, continuing the conversation around um, values based messaging. Um, Alyssa is just, Alyssa has got a very sh comment here. We are developing our annual report at the moment and providing short case studies. I'm not sure we are writing them in an interesting enough way. Any advice? Um, yep, I, for, even for annual reports, you can put those stories that flavour your message or reporting, put some little stories in, you know, breakout boxes. Use engaging headings. Thinking about think about your values activation. You know, grab a copy of that values map from last week. Just read a paragraph. Just have a look at the values chart. What am I activating? Is that what I want to activate? How can I reword this slightly? Um, it can be very subtle little language cues that you're using. You know, but they add up to a whole lot of um, persuasion and. It's, you know, you're activating values. Remember that, that everyone holds to be most important. You know that we know that from global research that people are telling us that they prioritise these universalism, benevolent, self-direction values. So you can really quite confidently speak to that. And it is creeping into our language more and more, I think. Thanks. And people love stories. People are hooked on stories. People. Yeah. Will your little breakout box stories about, you know, the farmer that did this, you know, that mm -hmm. because we want to make that human connection. Mm. And, you know, that's how we build empathy. We can see ourselves in each other. And that's that's so much part of building connection. And then this idea of social norms, this is, this is what we do. 